Good morning, Hope Church. So good that you came to worship Jesus this morning. I want to give a big shout out to our Eureka campus. Come on, give it up for your brothers and sisters in Eureka. We love you guys. We're so glad that you're joining us this morning. I, of course, am not joining you live because right now I am serving on a Tres Dias weekend as a spiritual director. So I have the privilege and honor of speaking four or five times over this weekend, but I did not want to miss speaking to my most favorite people in the world, Hope Church. Love you guys. And I felt like I had a message for you that I wanted to deliver to you. And so I know you're watching me on a screen and I'm not live, but I just got done praying that this message would be anointed to touch you, to speak to you, to challenge you, and to transform you. So um, we're gonna jump back in. This is the last installment of our message series called If. If, I love that little word that has so much potential. If is like a seed a seed of opportunity, it can be a seed of faith, but if we're not careful, it could also take us back into the things that, and the people that we used to be. So today we're gonna cap off uh, this message series with our last if that we're gonna explore in Romans chapter eight. So if you have your Bibles, if you'll jump in with me, Romans chapter eight, verses 24 and 25, and we're gonna get after the word of God together this morning. I hope that you're ready. And so I'm gonna pray, and then we're gonna read this together. Father, thank you for your spirit here right now, your presence, God. God, I pray that you would touch every single person this morning in a profound way, in a fresh way, in a new way. God, we give you this time now. We ask that you would breathe, make your word to come alive in us, Let it be like a seed of faith deeply planted in our spirits, God, that we could take and that we could move on and put it into action into our lives so that we can become more like your son, Jesus. Father, anoint me as I preach your word this morning. I pray that you would use it to transform your people and transform our church, transform our valley, transform this great state of Montana in Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said... Amen, amen. All right, Romans chapter eight, verses 24 through 25 says this. For in this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? In verse 25, but if we hope for what, and here, here's the, the last if this morning. But if we hope for what we do not yet have, We wait for it patiently. I'm gonna read that one more time. But if, yes, I like big butts and I cannot lie. I mean, theologically speaking or scripturally speaking, I like big butts. And anytime that we see a big butt in scripture, we know that there is something that God has a part for us to play in his promise. And so we're gonna dive into this little scripture, this big but here this morning. But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. We wait for it patiently. Now, I'm not a very patient guy. I wish Paul would have just kind of left that little word patiently out of the equation and just kept us in on hope. I like that. I love hope. I don't like patience, and if you're like me or anything like me, you probably struggle with waiting for things in your life too. And all through this message series, we started out with um, our if only regrets. We left behind the if onlys in our life, and we moved forward into the as if, acting as if what God has said is true, and moving forward into our lives into the what if possibilities that God has for us and how he uses and works all things for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose, which I know all of you in this room fall into that category. And so today, the title of my message is No Ifs, Ands, or Buts About It. No Ands, Ifs, or Buts About It. Turn to your neighbor and say, no excuses. No excuses. There is no ifs, 
ands, or buts about it, you see, because I believe that as we continue on this journey of exploring the what if possibilities that God has for your life and for my life, for our church's life, for God's kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven, that we can get into a place where uh, we can become a little bit of a victim through the circumstances in our life. For many of us at certain times in our life, maybe it is that you started a new exercise program, that you, were, you, you had um, uh, New Year's resolutions that you began, that you were excited about, you were believed that God was leading you into. God birthed a dream into your heart and into your spirit that you got excited about. There was a word that God spoke to you either through his word or somebody um, used a person in your life to, to give you a word that you believe God was using to speak to your spirit and to birth something new in it. Actually, when I was praying about this message, I really felt God gave me a picture for what some of you, I believe, are going through right now, and that is that you're in the middle of birthing pains. We talked about how um, if the same spirit, another if that we went into, if the same spirit that rose Jesus from the grave lives in you, then won't that same spirit give you life to your mortal bodies? In other words, won't it energize you? Well, one of the words for life um, that I love is the word quicken. And that word quicken, one of the definitions of quicken is to catalyze something or to conceive something. And I believe that as we've been going through this message series, even that God has been birthing or conceiving his word in you or planting his word in you that now is beginning to take root and come alive. And inevitably, as that word begins to birth something in you, there's something that we go through called grow, uh, birthing pains. Birthing pains. Now, I have some experience with this because for those of you who know me, I have five children. And I can attest to the fact that it's painful to have children. <laughs> well, at least, like, I know my wife can attest that it's painful for having children. I got to watch her painfully birth our five children. I wanna be careful and I thank God my wife isn't here right now, otherwise she might be staring me down from the front row with a dirty look, like, you don't know nothing about birthing pains. You're right, I don't. I just was an innocent bystander in the process, trying to love you through the process, honey. I love you, thank you for birthing our five children. But I believe that some of you are in the middle of birthing what God has conceived in you and in order for that to happen, you're going through some birthing pains. And the reality is, is anytime you believe that God is trying to do something new in your life, and I believe that God is trying to do something new in your life, I believe that you're gonna have to get rid of some of the old things in your life and step into the new. And that is extremely difficult. It can be hard. And there's a lot of uh, things that we can allow to become excuses in our lives. If only this happened. If only my circumstances were a little bit better right now, I could, I could step into that thing, the what if that God is calling me to do. And if I had just a little bit more money, and if I had a little bit better uh, communication skills, and if I had people who believed in me, and if I didn't have all this baggage from my past, and then we could get into the big butts of life. Oh, you know, I would um, serve on a team, Pastor Lance. I would follow this thing that God is birthing in me, but I can't right now. It kind of reminds me of when, when Jesus was calling people to follow him. And some of them would say to him, um, I, I will follow you, teacher, I will follow you, but first let me go bury my father. I'll follow you, but first let me do this. They had a ton of excuses. And, and, and finally Jesus just said, hey, the workers are few. The kingdom is ripe, but the workers are few. Let me tell you something. I believe that the field is ripe for you right now, but you gotta let go of the ifs, the ands, and the buts. And you gotta just let them get all the way. I love what Mark Batterson says in his book, If. Look at this quote that he says. He says, if you're looking for an excuse, you'll always find one. How true is that? You can find an excuse for anything. But he said the same is true for opportunity or of opportunity. God-ordained opportunities are all around you. 
God ordained, and let me tell you, I, I believe that is true for all of you in this room. I believe that is true for our church. God ordained opportunities are surrounding us right now. They're here all the time. Of course, many of them come disguised as problems, which we talked about last week, how God uses everything and wastes nothing, and he wants to use all the good, the bad, the ugly, and sometimes because our perspective is skewed, we're not looking for God opportunities, we're looking for them in the wrong places. And we don't realize that God can redeem the problems and the circumstances in your life, your weaknesses, your wounds, and all those things, and he can turn your problems into propositions. And despite what old adage says, opportunity doesn't knock. Sometimes you have to ask for it, seek it, and knock on it. But don't seek opportunities first and foremost. Seek God. If you do, opportunity will seek you. If you do, opportunity will seek you. And I believe that as you follow God and as you pursue him into the what-if possibilities, God is beginning, and this is why we have this door here. I believe this door is symbolic of this whole message series called If. On one side of the door, it represents the what-if possibilities that God has for you. On this side of the door is the place where we've been stuck. It's that dark room with no windows where we've been stuck in guilt, shame, held hostage to our past, the wounds of our past held hostage to our weaknesses, to our bad habits, our old patterns, our old way of thinking, our old way of doing life. And in order to break free from that old, we have to be willing in faith, to step over, open the door, to go through the door that God is opening and to step through that threshold, that place, that transition place from one place to the other. But transitions can be difficult. They can be hard. They can be challenging. It is, it is tough. I mean, that, that moment, I'll never forget that moment um, uh, uh, in birthing pains called crowning when, when the head finally starts coming through and you can, you can see the baby and, and now um, literally this new life is coming forth and it is one of the most beautiful and I know probably a little bit gross but hey, God could use it too. <laughs> and it is the most beautiful thing when that new life is in your arms and you're looking at it and you're thinking about all the what ifs that can happen through this new life that you got to be a part of. And I know that God is birthing some things in you and through you and wants to do, there's even more that we could ever ask or imagine if we will just allow God because he is able. Come on somebody this morning. God is able to do immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine. But there's some things I believe that Paul is trying to get through to us, that if we're going to step into these things, these what-if possibilities for God, you are going to encounter opposition. That's why I, why I wore my fighter shirt this morning. Yes, this is one of my favorite shirts. It says, become a fighter. And I wear it to remind myself that even every time I get up on this stage, it's a fight, it's a battle. I've got to step through fear. I've got to step through anxiety. I've got to step through all those those uh, um, accusations of the enemy that I'm not good enough, that I've got nothing significant to share with you, that God can't use me, that what I have prepared isn't good enough, what I'm gonna say isn't good enough, and I have to get back to the place, I have to fight through all that. Just like if you're gonna step into the things that God has in front of you, you're gonna have to fight through some things, and you're gonna have to battle them. And if you're gonna fight through them and you're gonna win, I love that, that Paul um, encourages a young leader, Timothy. He says, fight the good fight of faith. Come on, some of you just need to get your battle armor on and fight the good fight. You're not gonna take new ground without a fight, even though God has given it to you. Just like Joshua, God said, I've given you every place you've put your foot on. You already have the victory. Now you have to, uh, you have to take hold of it. And so if we're gonna take hold of this victory, there's some things that you're gonna have to take a hold of in your life, and I'm gonna have to take a hold of in my life. And the first thing is this, you're gonna have to hold on to hope. You're gonna have to hold on to hope with a death grip. Now I love, um, in the Greek word, the Greek word for hope is apizo, and it, our hope that we have as followers of Jesus is completely different than the hope that we have in this world. 
I mean, there's a lot of things that we hear, right? We hope that we win the lottery. I hope that uh, I get a promotion. I hope that my marriage lasts. I hope my son doesn't get addicted to drugs. I hope that I can make it one more day sober. Come on, I hope that I don't fall into that trap and that addiction again. I hope I don't go on the internet and look at that thing again. I hope, we can hope for all these things, but biblical hope is different. Biblical hope, the Bible says that hope is like an anchor for our soul. It, it, it goes through the veil. In other words, there is a priest, there is a man on the inside, Jesus Christ, that is our hope. And our hope is anchored to the person of Jesus. That means I've got something steadfast. I've got something that I could hold on to that's gonna carry me through all the trials, all the circumstances, all the pains, uh, the birthing pains, all those, those things in my life, the persecution. Because let me tell you, if you haven't experienced it yet, anytime you try to break into or break through the old into something new that God has for you, and you try to break free of your old patterns and your old ways of thinking into your new identity as a son or a daughter of Jesus Christ, you're gonna have to fight for it. And if you're gonna make it, you're gonna have to hold on to this thing called hope. Now, biblical hope, that word um, epizo, it actually means to eagerly hope, to wait with expectation. So it's not just like, I'm hoping, I'm actually waiting with expectation, holding on to what God has told me and what his word says and what he has said over my life. And I'm holding on to that as my hope. That's my hope. And see, I'm gonna show you how holding on to hope and then the next thing that we need to do, which is to put your faith to work. I'm gonna show you how hope and faith work together in conjunction. See, hope sees, hope, see, you have to have a picture ingrained in your mind of who God has called you to be, of what he's called you to do. There's sometimes that I have to just see in my mind's eye, and, and, and um, David talks about seeing through the eyes of faith or through the eyes of your heart. There's a scripture also that says, as a man thinketh, so he is. As you think in your heart, or let me show you to this way, as you see yourself in hope of what God has given you a picture of, that even though I don't see the reality of it playing out in my life right now, I can see it through the eyes of faith. I can see it in my spirit, in my, in my mind's eye, I can see it. And you have to hold on to that picture. You have to hold on to that hope. But look at how faith, um, I said put your faith to work because I believe that, some, that most of the time, not some of the time, I believe that most of the time our problem isn't believing the right things. Our problem is not acting on the beliefs that we have and therefore negating what God can do with that belief. God, I mean, even James said, and, and this is where there's a scripture in James who says faith uh, without works is dead. It means there, there's nothing to it. There's no substance to just believing. Yeah, James 2, 7, it says, in the same way, faith by itself, if you just take the belief in something, if you don't accompany it with action, in other words, put your faith to work, just like that, that scripture I shared last week, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. It's not that we're working for our salvation, but there's some things that we gotta allow God to work out of us and work into us. And the way that we do that, the mechanism that God uses to do that is this thing called faith. It's our belief, but a belief without putting it to work is just dead. So now let me go back to Hebrews 11.1 1, and show you how hope and faith work together. If hope is seeing what God wants to do, faith is taking a vision of what God has given you, that vision, and putting it into action day by day into your life. Look at this. Now faith is the confidence. I love that. You gotta have confidence in what we hope for, that vision that, that God has given you, that seed of what if possibilities that God is planting into your spirit through this, 
These, what God is doing in our church through this message series and through Romans chapter eight, it is full of faith, full of what if possibilities. But what if possibilities are a lot like belief or a lot like faith without action. And this is why a lot of us are making excuses for why we haven't, we, we've even blamed God. God, but if God only did this, and if he only did that, and God is saying, wait, wait, wait a minute here, but have you actually obeyed the word I already gave you? Have you actually obeyed and done and put into action by faith in your life the words I've already spoken to you and the things that I've already told you to do? And I guarantee you that if God called you to something, he is faithful to complete it. He is the author and finisher of our faith and he has everything in between to accomplish the word that he set forth in you. There's also a scripture in Habakkuk chapter two, verse three, that says that my word will not return to me void without accomplishing in season what I wanna do. And there's a key there, in season. Because we get too impatient and, and because uh, one day later, we're not changed on Monday when we go to work because we're not seeing all of what God spoke to us in our life immediately. Man, we, we live in a microwave society that we want everything quick. We are so used to jumping on our phones and getting answers quick uh, that we can't wait for anything these days. I mean, shoot, you go to get some gas and now I can't even, I can't even put my credit card in the gas machine without options. Do you want a Slurpee? Do you want your car washed? No, I just want some gas, thank you. I mean, we, we have options coming at us fast and furious and everything is instant, instant, instant. Can I tell you something? You can't microwave a God-sized plan. It takes time. It takes faith. It's the confidence in the thing that God has spoken to us and what we're hoping for, and it is the assurance. Another word in, in the NASB and some other translations, the ESV, that word assurance is swapped out for conviction. I like that word conviction better. Now faith is the, faith is the confidence in what we hope for, the conviction about what we do not see. And we're gonna look at that word conviction here in just a little bit. But you now you see when we take the hope that we have and we mix it with faith and we put it into action in our life every single day, we get to see how God works that plan into our life. There's a saying about dreams. Dreams are a lot like goals, but if you have a goal without a deadline, it's just a pipe dream. In other words, what if you stop focusing? See, here, here I think we have this problem. I believe that we tend to live too much either in the past or too much in the future. We're always thinking about the past and letting either the past haunt us or wishing things were like the past or we're thinking forward and we're thinking about the future too much and not enough on the present. Faith is acting on the word of God in the present, right here, right now. Every time I look at scripture, I keep getting confronted with that word now. In fact, Romans 8, the whole chapter starts with now, therefore. There is no condemnation in Christ Jesus. Now, in this moment, in the present. What is God speaking to you right now? What if you started approaching every single Sunday, every time we gathered and you heard a message, and every time that you opened, cracked open your Bible and read passage of scripture? What if every conversation that you had with somebody, you were listening, you're, you were in tune, in faith, believing that God was gonna speak something to your spirit? And if, what if everything that you heard, you took notes and you asked yourself, okay, I heard God speak to me this through the message Pastor Lance gave on Sunday. How can I apply this to my life on Monday? How can I put it in action? How can I make it work for the hope that I have? What can I do to put it into action in my life? What if you started approaching every single day like putting one more thing into action in your life that God spoke into you and through his word? Come on, in the same way, faith by itself, if not accompanied by action, is dead. Okay, so what we need to do, there, there was this, um, 
I think he was this, this world-renowned surgeon, Mr. Osler, um, and he, he gave this uh, commencement speech one time at a college, and they asked him to share you know, one of his greatest life lessons. And in that, it was something that, that he learned over time to, and he kind of coined this phrase, to live in day-tight compartments. Live in day-tight compartments. And if you could put that up on the screen. And what he meant by that is that instead of trying to focus so much on the future and so much on the past, that if you'll take, come on, this guy, I don't think he was a theologian, but it just reminds me of Jesus. It says that he said, you know, don't worry about tomorrow. Forget about yesterday. Don't worry about tomorrow. Every day has enough problems on its own. What if we approach it? I love that God created time and he organized time in such a way that every single day we have a 24-hour window of time. And every single night, think about all the billions of people in the world go to sleep at some point in time and they wake up and we all get to experience a new day. I love that God's word says his mercies are new every day. Every day. Great is thy faithfulness every day. Every day. Today is the day of salvation. Today I can experience a little bit more of the salvation that Jesus gave his life for. Today I become a little bit more like him. Today I can become a little bit more whole. But what if we started focusing on the daytime compartment of today, the present, right now? What if we stopped paying so much attention to our phones? What if we stopped paying so much attention. Think about how much time we spend on movies and TV and distractions. And even my wife and I were talking about how much time we spend, and we love our kids playing sports, but how much time we spend running our kids around and going to this sporting event and that sporting event, and, and how much we miss out potentially on what God wants to do today in the daytime compartment of the here and now. You know, when you think about, think about in your own life, when you're trying to do something new, think about if you said, I'm gonna make a commitment, I'm not gonna eat sugar for a year because I know it's not good for my body, but I like it. But I'm not gonna, I'm gonna go on a diet for a year and I'm not gonna eat sugar. Or maybe even more extreme, what if you've had a problem with alcohol or drugs or pornography, and you said, I'm never gonna drink alcohol again. I'll never do another drug. I'll never look at another uh, thing again like that. And in your mind, it's forever. But what if, and it becomes so hard because when you think about never doing that ever again, that becomes insurmountable. But when you think about it in the compartment of today, that's why in AA, they give, they give you those chips for 30 days because they want you to stay focused on today. I may not be able to do this forever, but I can make it through today. I could get through this day tight compartment. I can make it through this day without touching a drink. I can make it through this day without looking at poor. I can make it through this day without shooting up. I'm going to live in that daytime, day tight compartment. Uh, C.S. Lewis is one of my favorite authors. Do we have any C.S. Lewis fans? Come on. To me, he's one of the greatest, one of the greatest, even, uh, I believe, a, a theologian. And he wrote this book called The Screwtape Letter. And in it, C.S. Lewis is trying to get us to understand that there's two things that he believes that God wants us to stay focused on. Number one is eternity. And I, I agree with him the, with that. In fact, I was having a great conversation with uh, an awesome guy in our, in our church and after, after church last Sunday, and we were talking about how we easy, easy, so easily lose sight of eternity. I mean, we, we lose sight the fact that we're in this for the long haul. Like, our life doesn't end when our life here on earth ends. That eternity goes on forever, and the things that we do in the here and now are actually sowing into our eternal life. The Bible's very clear that someday we're gonna stand before Jesus, we're actually gonna have to give an account to him for every day-tight compartment of a day that we've lived. 
And what we did with the gifts, the talents, the resources that God has blessed us with, living here in this amazing country called the United States of America, the opportunity, the what ifs that God laid in front of us, what did you do with those? And then he also says that we're gonna be rewarded based on the things that we uh, did on this earth. And, and he warns us many times that the first will be last and the last first. In other words, there are people right now that probably have a bigger reward in heaven than I do because they're servants. They're serving. They're serving in kids' ministry. They're serving in the kitchen. They're serving in prayer. People are praying for you right now, even as the service is going on. And, and their reward, they may not see the full fruit of their reward here and now, in this lifetime, but they'll see it in the future. I've got a great example of that. My, my aunt, Rita, who I love dearly and is here visiting, and she's probably sitting right, right there on the front row, and Aunt Rita, I love you. I may not be here right now if it wasn't for this woman in my life. Because of her faithfulness of living in faith and believing that God had a call on my life, and she had a conviction of that. She prayed for me for years and years and years and years. And when I was the furthest away from God, let me say this to even encourage some of you parents here and some of you grandparents and some of you spouses that you've been praying for your husband, you've been praying for your sons and your daughters and your grandchildren, and you don't see anything happening. You don't see any movement. In fact, sometimes it gets worse before it gets better. That's a word for somebody here. Don't lose faith because she kept praying, she kept believing, and she kept acting in faith. She would send me letters in the mail. She would write me letters. And in those letters, she would tell me, God's got a call and a plan on your life. And she would give me scriptures. And I would read these letters and I would read them. And I, in my heart, I wanted to believe them. But my reality was so far removed because I was partying. I was in all this stuff. But sometimes the faith of somebody else will even even bring you into the kingdom because they believe it and they see it so much that it catches in your spirit and you begin to have hope. And I began to have hope that maybe I could become like this. And I believe it was those seeds that eventually led me to surrender my life to the Lord. But I say that because I believe that if we don't continue daily to act in faith on what God has given us, uh, it, back to the screw tape letters, and C.S. Lewis, he wrote this amazing book. And in this book, there's these demons and they actually have a plan and strategy. You know, there is a supernatural uh, uh, world that we don't see. And I believe the reality of that. And so these demons are talking to each other. And this is, this is a couple of quotes from the book that I love that will help us understand how the enemy, and, and this is part of your battle, is living in the present. Live in the present with God. So much of Romans 8 is about walking in the spirit daily with God every single day. God, what do you have? It's the wild goose chase. I love it. The Celtic word for Holy Spirit is wild goose. And I love that, that picture because every single day, God can lead us on the greatest adventure of our life if we will just allow him and his word to lead us and guide us. And look what they say. They say, our business is to get them away from the eternal and from the present. And then he says this, we want, and there, this is one little demon, screw tape, talking to another one. And he says, we want a whole race perpetually in pursuit of the rainbow's end. Never honest, nor kind, nor happy now, but always using as mere fuel wherewith to heap on the altar of the future every real gift which is offered them in the present. And I believe that if we will begin to Exercise our faith. Faith is like a muscle. It needs to be stretched. And this, is, this will make some of you uncomfortable. Stretching is not comfortable. It's painful. It hurts. But if you allow God to stretch you, take you out of your comfort zone, and to begin to act on what you believe God is speaking and doing, and you'll do it in the present, right here, right now. So this is so cool. If God has given you a big dream for your life, well, you better have small goals. In other words, it's the mundane, everyday little things that, that if you do those little things in faith, faithfully over time, then you're gonna see some movement in your life, little by little. God is going to move and you're going to see those things begin to take, uh, take root in your life 
and they're gonna begin to be worked out in and through your life. The third thing that we're gonna need to be able to fight this battle and to continue to move into the what ifs, God, is that you're gonna need to live with conviction. You're gonna need to live with conviction. Now, conviction, by definition, is a strong belief in something. I would call it, I'm anchored. I am anchored. I have a deep conviction about something, and, and, and this better be. So now, Romans also, t- there's another scripture in Romans that says, now faith uh, comes from hearing, and hearing by the word of God, or the message of Christ. So faith is tied to the word of God. I believe that our convictions need to be uh, tied or anchored in the word of God and our hope. But I believe this is where some of us, we can get a little bit off track, where we could start to compromise. We could start to, uh, and we could get those ifs, ands, and buts, and we can allow them to... uh, weaken our hope and weaken our faith to where we start to make little compromises in our convictions, in our faith. And over time, if we allow it, those little compromises will slowly erode your faith. And some of you are here this morning and you know exactly what I'm talking about. Your faith has been eroded over time because you haven't stuck to the convictions in your spirit. You've compromised those convictions. You've compromised the word of God. You've compromised your belief. And you've allowed that compromise to pull you away and begin to make excuses. And you start actually even blaming God why he hasn't allowed those things that he spoke into you, the dream that he gave in your heart, why you haven't seen them come to pass. And you've grown tired and weary. And some of you, if you allow it, you might even get to the point where you're ready to give up. You're done fighting. You're not doing it anymore. You're finished. And then when we get to that point, that's when we just start existing instead of really living. And everything that Jesus died for to give you, that life, the spirit within you, that can quicken you into that life is just lying dormant. And my hope and prayer that is at the end of this message for some of you, that those God dreams would be resurrected back to life that are dead within you, that they would be re-quickened, if you will, in your spirit and made to come alive. Look at Galatians 6, 9. And I even wanna pray for some of you at the end of this message here. And I'm almost done. Because I believe there's some of you that are growing tired, you're growing weary, and you're barely hanging on. Paul was trying to encourage his church in Galatia, Galatia, and this is what he said, and let us not lose heart and grow weary and faint in acting nobly and doing right. For in due time and the appointed season, we shall reap. There's the conviction that you need to have this morning. In other words, what I'm trying to tell you, if you don't lose heart, and Jesus said, take heart, for I have overcome the world, and greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. That means whatever you're going through right now, it's all trying to take you out of the present with God and what he wants to do in you today, right now. But if you don't lose heart, and if you don't grow weary, And if you don't faint, if you don't give up, if you act nobly, you keep doing right, keep in faith, faithfully sowing in the seeds of the word of God that God put in your life in hope that you will reap something good in due season. If you don't loosen and relax our courage and faint. In other words, if you don't give up, you gotta hold on to hope you got to put your faith in action. And you got to stand deeply on the convictions that God has for you. Those convictions are, and then the last thing that I would say to you to encourage you this morning is you need to keep calm and carry on. 
Keep calm and carry on. Now, if you've ever been to London, England, or anywhere in England, you're gonna, you, you've probably seen that, that phrase all over the place. And actually, what it dates back to is in um, 1939, when, uh, when the Nazis were invading England and uh, Hitler had, um, had this strategy called Blitzkrieg, where he just he bombed over hundreds of cities over, over England, and he thought he could completely break the will of England and have them surrender, and his plan actually backfired on him. I actually believe that is, even as I'm saying this, this is prophetic for some of you, that you feel like the enemies had an all-out blitz, blitzkrieg on you, an all-out warfare, an all-out attack uh, on trying to destroy what God intended for good. And I wanna tell you that if you will hang on in hope and let your faith work for you and that you will stick to your convictions and then if you'll keep calm and carry on and if you'll fight every single day because really what keep calm and carry on is waiting for in patience because in England, instead of surrendering, what it did is it backfired and it ended up energizing them and Winston Churchill gave this wonderful speech and, and ignited a nation to fight back and he said to him, never, never, never give in. Never give up except for your convictions. And one of the, one of the war posters that came out of, um, out of that speech and, and um, part of the English strategy to, to keep their nation strong and united against this, this war with the Germans was this phrase. One of them was found years later that the posters that were made that said keep calm and, calm and carry on never actually made it up. And, and some bookstore owner found these posters and, and put them up and it became this national slogan, keep calm and carry on. I, I wonder if we would adopt that same slogan in our own life, in our own spiritual walk. Instead of getting all sideways, when, when you go out of here and somebody cuts you off or tomorrow morning when you go into work and your boss is a jerk to you or your wife is grumpy in the morning or your husband is a jerk, what if instead of getting all frazzled and all worked up that you just kept calm and carried on? I believe that's what Paul is saying, that if we hold on to hope and we wait for it patiently, that's what this is about. Keeping calm and carrying on is all about waiting for it with patience, patience, patience. Wait for it with patience. And I'm gonna share with you um, this, this last scripture that I believe that God wants to, to use. Um, that word patiently in the Greek is the word hypo, hypomone, hypomone. It means patiently. It means steadfastness, constancy, endurance, uh, in the New Testament, it's the characteristic of a man who is unswerved from his deliberate purpose and his loyalty to faith and piety by even the greatest trials and sufferings. I love this. It is the attitude of the soldier who is in the thick of the battle, is not dismayed, but fights on stoutly, whatever the difficulties. That's what this is. I believe that Romans chapter eight is a conviction. It starts out with, therefore, now there is no condemnation in Christ Jesus. It is sandwiched in the middle with uh, God working all things for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. And then reminding us that we are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus who loved us. And ending with um, that there is no, I believe, I have a conviction and confidence that there is no separation from the love of God in Christ Jesus. But we gotta wait sometimes, and this is the hard part for most of us. It's the hard part for me, waiting for it patiently. That in the middle of the battle, that we don't give up, that we're holding on in hope, that we're believing for the things that God has spoken to us. It reminds me of, um, I was reading about Coca-Cola Company and when it started, and this amazing fact that shows the power of patience over time, that if you invested or bought one stock of Coca-Cola in the Coca-Cola company in 1919, or really if your great-grandparents bought stock in the Coca-Cola company in 1919, and if they held on to that stock and waited patiently, believing 
that someday there would be a reward for it. That in the year 2000, that one stock that they bought for $40, which was a lot of money back then, that one stock that they bought for $40 would be worth over 6,307 shares if they reinvested that stock every year would have turned into 6,307 shares and be worth $7 million. $7 million from a $40 investment. It's the power of compound interest. It's the power of patience. I wonder how many of you, if you will keep holding on, keep believing, keep pressing into God, keep putting into action the things that he's spoken to you, if you won't see him come to pass if you don't give up. Because I believe this, that Paul, at the end of Romans chapter eight, he talks about all the ifs, ands, or buts that can separate us from the love of God. He starts out with who will condemn you? Nobody. In fact, he goes on to say that Jesus is sitting at the right hand of God interceding for you. So when he says no in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. He means that word more than conquerors is, is this amazing word. Um, and it's, it's actually where we get the word Nike. <laughs> and it means that you are a hyper conqueror, that, that you have an overwhelming ability to overcome anything that comes at you in your life. And for most of us, we don't feel like that. We actually feel like maybe we're an undercomer. But this is saying to us that we are all these things, no matter what comes your way, no matter what trials, no matter what persecution, no matter what hardship, no matter what circumstances, that you are more than a conqueror. You have to have a conviction. Why? Because in all these things, we're more than a conqueror through him who loved us. See, Paul's conviction was that God loves me and because God loves me, I can get through anything. I could get the worst of days. Now, this isn't just some guy who's writing this on a piece of paper. This is a guy who lived with the scars to show it on his back. He'd been in prisons. He'd been whipped. He'd been beaten. He'd been flogged. He'd been shipwrecked multiple times. And this was his conviction as he held on to a plank in the water, wondering if, whether he was going to live or die. I'm going to end with this, this story about this uh, this federal judge that was appointed by Ulysses S. Grant in 1875. And um, he was on his deathbed. His name was John Bruce. And he was a federal judge. And he lived his whole life with a conviction that God was going to use him in this country as a federal judge. And I believe he did. But he was on his deathbed and he asked his daughter to grab the Bible and she brought over the Bible and he asked her to turn to Romans chapter eight. And he feebly put his finger on Romans chapter eight, verses 38 through 39. And without looking, he repeated this verse, these two verses. He said this, for I am convinced that neither death nor life, you see what Paul says, I am convinced. John Bruce lived his life with conviction. I'm convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor demons, neither present nor future nor any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And with those last words, he took his last breath. See, John Bruce died with his finger on that conviction I'm wondering what you can do and I could do living with our life on that conviction every single day. I'm gonna pray for you. Father, I thank you for your word this morning. God, I pray that it would be more than a message, more than words, but God, that your words would be quickened in us this morning. Father, I wanna pray for those, and I wanna pray for those right now, they're in the middle of, they're feeling those birthing pains, they're feeling the, the uncomfortableness, the pain, 
the stretching, and they feel stuck. I wanna pray for those that are in that place this morning, God. I pray right now, Holy Spirit, will you encourage them this morning? I pray for an extra um, amount of your grace upon them to not only uh, be more than a conqueror through it, but God, I pray that your love would be the fuel for their spirit that would help them, Father, overcome every obstacle, everything that is in the way of discovering and walking in the what if possibilities that you have for their life. God, I wanna pray for those this morning that they're, they, one time the dream that you put in their heart was very much alive, but it is now dead and dormant. I wanna speak to those dreams right now. I wanna speak to them and I wanna prophesy over them just like Isaiah prophesying to those, those dead and dry bones. And I wanna say, come to life in Jesus' name. Holy Spirit, I pray that you breathe on every single dead dream, every single dead word, things and prophecies that have been spoken over your life. I pray that they would come alive and be quickened in you right now in Jesus' mighty name. And God, I pray for those this morning that are tired of doing good and they're weary and they're on the edge of giving up. I pray for those that are on the edge of giving up on their marriage. I pray for those that are on the edge of giving up on their kids. I pray for those that are, are ready to quit their job. I pray for those who are ready to quit their ministry or their place that they're serving in the church. And Father, right now I pray by the power of your Holy Spirit that you would quicken them and make them come alive again and give them strength, God. Give them patient endurance to stand and to not give up, to not grow weary, because there is, let them have a deep down conviction, Holy Spirit, Put it deep within them. Let it be a foundation, a conviction in them. God, that there is a harvest coming for them if they will just hold on. In Jesus' mighty name, God bless you guys.